Okay, Dove? Okay. Good. Okay, good morning. Good morning. So I had uh, promised you last time that we would begin with a really very beautiful teaching that I heard when I was a student at Ner Yisrael from Rav Yaakov Galinsky of Blessed Memory. And it had to do with um, Yosef, I forgot how we brought it up last time. We had mentioned Osnat, who Yosef had married, okay? And someone brought up a medrash, which is a fascinating medrash, of who she actually was. So this was a talk that I heard from Rav Yaakov Galinsky, and actually this was in, must have been the very early 1980s, 82, 83, and that was the time when the Shah had been overthrown in Iran, and Khomeini had risen to power, and Nehru Yisrael had taken in a, a large number of Iranian, uh, I won't call them refugees, young men, right, whose parents had sent them out of Iran not knowing where things were heading. And the yeshiva um, had, I would guess, 30 or 40 uh, Iranian, Iranian young men who were studying in the yeshiva. And many of them have, have gone on to become, uh, I know there's a, a rabbi in, in, in Los Angeles, part of, the R, part of the RCC there, who's, uh, who's uh, Rabbi Davidi, right, who I was in Israel with right, when I moved here and we, got, and I, and we saw each other. Oh, it was, uh, it, it was nice to see an, an old friend. And Rav Yaakov Galinsky came and he spoke about the concept of Mesirut Nefesh. Mesirut Nefesh means um, really giving of yourself for someone else, giving of yourself for Hashem. And he spoke how Mesirut Nefesh always gets paid back. It never goes, it's never forgotten. We'll always have a, a, a very, very powerful, powerful a rebound reflection onto the person. Right, you're speaking primarily to these Iranian boys. Good morning. To these Iranian boys who had left their families, left their country, who had left so much behind and were now truly on their own. So, it was funny, he, he, he spoke in Yiddish to the whole yeshiva. My, my Yiddish is very, very, very poor. I, 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 I mentioned before a true story that when the first shmuz, the first sicha that, uh, the, that Rav Rudiman Zatzal, who was the Rosh Hashiva, gave, was about how everyone needs to be involved in their learning, right? And in Yiddish, involved is orangutong, right? So I listened to the schmooze, and I asked someone afterwards, why was he speaking about orangutangs? <laughs> At that point, it became very clear that, uh, that if there was a choice of hearing it in Yiddish or in Hebrew, I would opt for the Hebrew. So after speaking in Yiddish, Rav Yaakov Galinsky spoke in Hebrew, mostly for the Iranian boys, right, who didn't obviously don't, don't, don't have any, any, any background in Yiddish. And he raised the question. He raised the question that seems to go against, go against this idea of Mesir and Nefesh paying off. The question actually began, begins, you turn back to Parsha Dvayetze on page Parsha 
156. And what's happening at this point is all of the Shvatim, all of the tribes, are being born. And at this point, Leah has just given birth to her sixth son. Okay? Yisachar and Zvulun were just born. Those are numbers five and six. Now, Bila already has two, and Zilpa already has two. So of the possible 12 tribes, 10 have been born. And then verse 21, V'achar yalda bat. Afterwards, a daughter was born, V'atikra et shema dina. And she was named Dina. Okay? Now, and then God remembers Rachel, and, and she gives birth to to Yosef, and then ultimately to Binyamin. Why this emphasis on this Dina being born? Rashi brings the Medrash that Leah became pregnant with what could have been, or might have been, her seventh son, which would have meant that more than half of the Jewish tribes of the nation of Israel were coming from her. And we know how fixated they were on having tribes because when she had her third son, Levi, so now she's done her, their four wives, 12 sons, three each. Hapam, now my husband will accompany me. I've done my share. She names, she has a fourth son, names him Yehuda, right? The special praise and thanks that she has more than her share. And now she has the opportunity to have seven. But she made a din, she made a calculation, that if she were to have seven, then Rachel, Rachel, will have only one. She will be less than the maidservants. And she prayed that it should be a girl because of this din that she was done, because of this calculation that she made. And the Pasuk tells us, afterwards a daughter was born, and she named that daughter Dina. Why Dina? Because of this din, because of this calculation. So, we look, he said, we look at the Mesiwat Nefesh that went into the birth of this Dina. She sacrificed so much out of her love, out of her compassion for her sister, out of this kindness to her sister. So we would imagine just how much Nachat how wonderful will it be with Dina, right? It's going to be just wonderful, wonderful things happening with Dina. Yet we turn to page 180, 181, and we read there, Perak Lamedalid, chapter 34, that takes a Dina bat Leah shall yadal Yaakov lirot with no ta'aretz. Dina, the daughter of Leah, right, went out to sea, and she is sighted by Shechem ben Chamor. He takes her, lies with her, violates her, right? This is the agmat nefesh, the incredible pain that Dina brings. Not, not what she did wrong, but this is the pain that's coming to the parents from this girl, Dina. And Yaakov Galitzi asks, it doesn't make sense. So much Mesirut Nefesh went in to this Dina, being born to this Dina, how could it possibly be that out from her comes such anguish and such, uh, uh, and such humiliation? to her and to the family. And we don't hear anything more after this. That's the end. So we have the parents, we have the mother, I should say, not the parents, we have Leah putting in so much Messiah and Nefesh for the birth of this Dina, and then we have this pain and anguish and humiliation that comes from this Dina. 
and it seems very, very strange. Let's go now to our, let's put that aside for a minute, and let's come now to our Parsha. Our Parsha picks up with Yosef still in prison. Why is he in prison? Potiphar's wife. wife, who had tried to seduce him, and when she was unsuccessful, she blamed and, 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 and blamed and said that he's the one who initiated that, and he's thrown into prison. And he's there in prison, and then he sees the two of Paro's uh, servants are there, the butler and the baker, and he says to them, he saw that their faces were down, and he said to them, why are you down? Right? It's very, actually very, very important. Right? The wording is... Yosef came to them in the morning, page 218, verse 6. And he saw them, zo afim. They were, the English says, they were aggrieved. And he said to them, verse 7, Right? Why are your faces, how do they translate that? Why do you appear downcast? That's done well. Why do you appear downcast today? Right? So you see that what's set in motion this whole Yosef being taken out of prison was that he saw, he noticed other people weren't feeling that well, weren't doing that well. And he took out the time to ask them, everything okay? How are you? You don't look so good today. Is everything all right? right? Yosef took out the time to note that. They tell him his dreams. Yosef interprets the dreams. And the interpretation comes true. The butler was reinstated. The baker was killed. And now, Vahimi Kech Natayim Yamim, we start on page 222. And it was at the end of two years. Ufaro Cholain, Paro dreamt, Vihine Omeid Alayor. And he's standing by the river. Paro has his dreams, right? The dreams of the seven cows, the seven. The seven uh, healthy cows and the seven thin cows. And then he had the, the second dream again with the seven ears of grain, right? Once again, consumed by the, the, the seven healthy strong ones were consumed by the seven thin and scorched ones. And no one can interpret this dream in a way that is acceptable to Paro. Now, this butler, whose dream was interpreted by Yosef, is in a bind. He does not want to mention Yosef. Right? He had two years to mention Yosef. Yosef had said to him, please, when you get out, let them know I was innocent. Right? Help me. He did nothing to help him. Now he's being forced into a difficult situation. If he doesn't say anything, then when word gets out that he knew someone in prison who interpreted the dreams and doesn't say anything to Paro, he'll be held responsible for that. At the same time, he doesn't want to really help Yosef. So what does he do? He basically puts down Yosef in a very, very thorough manner. And let's pick up from then. Let's pick up um, pas oh, page 223. 222 in Hebrew, Pasuk Tet. Vaidaber Sara Mashkim et Paro Lemor. So I want to take that in Hebrew first. Vaidaber Sara Mashkim et Paro Lemor et Chatai Ani Mazkir Take one more. Paro Kata O Avadav Vaite Oti Mishmar Beit Sara Tabachim Oti. Good. Um, take two more. You, you, you're doing so beautifully. The Nachalma. The Nachalma, Halo, the Laila, Echad, and Ibahu, Ish, Kefitron, Halomo, Halamu, Basham, Itanu, Nar, Ivri, Eved, Usar, Hatat, Bachim, Vinis, Vanis, Afer, Lo, Vai Yiftar Lanu et Kalamotenu Ish Kaha 
Qatar. Beautiful. In English, please, from verse 9, somebody. Then the chamberlain of the cupbearer spoke up before Pharaoh. My transgressions do I mention today. Pharaoh had become incensed at the servants and placed me in the ward of the house of the chamberlain of the butchers, me and the chamberlain of the bakers. We dreamt a dream on the same night, I and he, each one according to the interpretation of his dream did we dream. And there with us was a Hebrew youth, a slave of the chamberlain of the butchers. We related it to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. He interpreted for each in accordance with his dream. And it was that just as he interpreted for us, so did it happen. Me, he restored to my post, and he hanged. Good. So he said there was a Hebrew youth, a slave. Right? He's putting him down, but he's got to mention. There's one. You guys could. There's seats. Come, come. Right? So he puts down Yosef, but he, but he mentions that. Now this next passage is incredible. Vayikra et Yosef, vayiritzuhu min habor. So Paro sent, summoned Joseph, and they pulled him out, they rushed him out, min habor. Right? The English says, from the dungeon. Fair enough. Right? Now, what have we called the prison until now? In the Hebrew had it, Beit HaSohar is a term that was used. Right? In English they called it a building, I believe. Hmm? I think they called it a building in English. Yeah, or a Mishmar. No, a Beit HaSohar. Yeah, we called it a Beit HaSohar. That's what we called the prison. Now we're not calling it a beta sor, we're calling it a boar. What does that remind us of? Was Yosef ever in a boar before that? What is a boar? Yeah. It's a pit. It's a pit. Right? So what's happening over here? They're rushing Joseph out of the pit. Meaning, Yosef has not gotten out of that pit that the brothers had thrown him all these years, right? It was up and down, up and down. He's still been in that pit. He's still been suffering the repercussions of his being thrown into the pit, sold as a slave, then right, working as a slave in someone's house, in the house of Potiphar, and then, and then being uh, falsely accused, being put into prison, right? Now, finally... They are taking him out of this pit. Vayigalach, right? And they had him shave. Vayachalev amsim lotav. They had him change his garments. Vayavo el paro, and he came to paro, and paro then relates his dream to Yosef, and Yosef is the one who interprets the dream. Okay, let's, and here he interprets it on page 226, 227, seven good years, seven lean years, right, and therefore put things away, right, set the country up in a way that you will make it through the seven lean years when you have the seven good years, right, human, right, it seems obvious, but human nature is whatever we have, we assume we will always have. And, excuse me, we just adjust our, uh, our um, level of living according to that new standard. And then all of a sudden when it crashes, then we are in a difficult situation. The seven good years, no reason they wouldn't assume it's always going to be like this, right? Every financial bubble, right, whether it's uh, the internet bubble that we go through, whether it's the real estate bubble, Right? We constantly have these bubbles that we go through. When we're in the bubble, we think this is the new world order. We don't see it as a bubble. Afterwards, when it bursts, we realize it was a bubble. These seven years would have been a wonderful bubble for them. He had to let them know it's going to burst, and therefore from day one, start to prepare. That's the interpretation that he gives. What is Paro's 
what is Paro's response? Right, let's go on 229. Someone taking English from 39. Then Paro said to Yosef. Then Paro said to Yosef, since God has informed you of all this, there can be no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and by your command shall all my people be sustained. Only by the throne shall I outrank you. Good. And then jump down, right, to 44. Pharaoh said to Yosef, I am Pharaoh, and without you, no man may lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh called Yosef's name Zaphinat Paneah, and he gave him Asenat, daughter of Potiphera, chief of On, for a wife. Thus Yosef emerged in charge of the land of Egypt. Okay. So he gave him a wife. Who's the wife? Asnat, the daughter of Potipharah. Hmm, interesting. Why would he marry Asnat, the daughter of Potipharah? It actually makes perfect sense. Because he, now he's like, he's rising through the ranks. He was just in jail for supposedly seducting Potiphar. Mm -hmm. So now, Potipharah, Poti now that she, she's kind of, I think this is showing her as kind of a bag, bandwagoner, as like, now he's rising to status, she isn't going to hold on her to her claim, no. She's going to be like, oh, that was my mistake. Here's some... Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe Pharaoh was trying to say, I know you're innocent. Yeah. You know, there, there, there's a famous story, I forget with which rub it was, mm -hmm. that a, a simple tailor had, had borrowed money from, from this Rav's um, free loan, a gemach that he had, that he lent out, right? And when the time was up, he came back. The Rav was busy studying, so he, he, he handed in the envelope. The Rav took the envelope, put it into the back of the safe that he was studying from, you know, thanked him and continued studying. And then basically forgot that he had, uh, this person had repaid the loan. Uh, the next week or so, he goes over his books and he sees, oh, this person's loan is still outstanding. He calls in this person. The person says, Rav, I, I, I paid you back. I came. He had no recollection. Right? So um, he had to he had to swear. I forget the whole, all the details, right? But no, and the t word got out, and in town, no one believed this poor tailor, right, against the word of the rav, of the rabbi. And, and basically, right, his business was ruined, and his, his life, everything, everything, everything went south very quickly for this poor, poor person. Months later, the rav pulls out a safer to look up something, and an envelope falls out. And in the envelope is the, all the money that this, that this tailor had paid back. And he realizes what happened. So he went running to ask forgiveness. So the tailor said, yeah, I'll forgive you. But, um, you know, my life's been ruined. You know, it's not going to change that. So the Rav said, I'll get up and I'll make an announcement that... It was my mistake. And Taylor said, I appreciate that. But everyone's going to say, oh, the Rav is such a tzaddik so that he's doing this in order to, to try to help me. But still no one's going to believe me. And the Rav said, oh. he said, I've got, I forgot which one it was, but I've got a son of marriageable age. You have a daughter of marriageable age. Let's make a shiduch. Because, right, and then everyone will understand if our, if our families are marrying into one another, clearly, 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 you're not a person who had, and, and that would clearly show that you are on the up and up. So the al Sheikh says, that was, that was the idea over here with Yosef. Yosef becoming the, the second in command of Egypt. But at the same time, he's an accused... He's accused of trying to, to violate the, the wife of an officer. 
So what will clearly show that he's on the up and up? Let him marry the daughter. Okay? But what comes very strange is, if we'll zoom up ahead a little bit, to Vayichi. Now, Yosef's already in Egypt, and the brothers come down. Spoiler alert, Yosef doesn't say who he is, but then he reveals his identity. We might have come across that before, <laughs> once or twice. Right? And then Yaakov comes down to, to Mitzrayim. On page 270, he says to Yosef, Pasuke, Vata and now, Shnei Vanecha, Hanoladim Lacha, the Eretz Mitzrayim, the two sons that were born to you in the land of Mitzrayim, Ad Boi Alecha Mitzrayim, before I came to Mitzrayim, Li Haim, they are considered to be mine. Ephraim and Menashe, your two sons, Ephraim and Menashe, Kiruvain Vishimon, Yihiyuli, will be to me like Reuven and Shimon. They will have the status of Shvatim, of tribes. And it seems so strange because we know just how fixated everyone was on who they would marry. And Avram made sure Eliezer went back to his town that, that Yitzchak should marry only someone from his family. If, if he marries from the Bunot Canaan, from the women of Canaan, right, it'll be, it'll, it'll be a travesty. And Yitzchak marries Rivka. And then Yaakov, when he's time for him to get married, unlike Asaph, who had married women from the area there, so uh, Rivka insisted he go back to our family. And he married Rachel and Leah. And even, even Billa and Zilpa were also the were also the daughters of Lavan Rashi told us, but from a Pilak show from concubines. Right? So it was always marrying daughters from the family line. And now we have Yosef in Egypt marrying the daughter of this of this uh, adulterous Potiphar, Potiphar's wife. And all of a sudden two of the children, two of the children are now Shvatim, are equal to Reuven and Shimon. They're equal to the children of, uh, of Rachel, the, ch the children of Leah, the children of Bil, the children of Zilpah. It seems very, very strange. So Yaakov Galinsky, coming back to where we started earlier, tells us that the story with Dina, so we left off the story of Dina, the mother made such mesirat nefesh for Dina's birth, and instead of it bringing nachat and pleasure, it brought anguish and pain. The medrash goes further and tells us that it got worse. Not only was Dina violated by Shechem ben Chamor, but a child was born from this illegitimate union. A daughter was born. And the Medrash says, Pekid Rabbi Lazar, that the, bra the Shvatim wanted to do away with this little girl. How could it be that Jacob, Yaakov, has a granddaughter from Shechem, the son of Hamor? It was such a disgrace to the house of Yaakov. And Yaakov said, do not do any harm to this girl. But they sent her away. The Medrash says that the Ka'ba Gavriel, I believe, the Malach Gavriel, the angel Gabriel, came and led this girl down to Egypt. And in Egypt, she was adopted. Who was she adopted by? By the Potiphar family. And they named her Asna. Oh, that's how we left off this week with it. We mentioned that both Tamar, last week we said both Tamar and the wife of Potiphar had... Uh, pure intentions when they started out because the wife of Potiphar had seen through her astrology whatever it was that from her family and Joseph's family children would result she thought it was from her but in fact it was from this girl Osnat so Osnat the major says was adopted by the Potiphar family so now when Yaakov when Yosef is given Osnat as a wife, so for all intents and purposes, it seems, oh, this is just an Egyptian girl. 
but the heavenly orchestration is at full work over here. Who is this girl? She is from the family of Yaakov, from the family of Leah, from the family of Dina. So in the end... But isn't this a forbidden union? Hmm? Uh, marrying the niece? No, actually it's not. It's not? Actually it's not. Well, f- well even if it would be, remember that before the Torah was given, we have a lot of such. We have sisters, right? Right? But actually, a or maybe a sister's daughter might be an issue, a brother. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But certainly before Matan Torah, this was not going to be an issue. Right? And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So in the end, Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky started to pound on the table. He said, we asked, Mesir and Nefesh always pays off. Right? So what happened over here? What was the Mesir and Nefesh that, Le- that Leah had made? She prayed that she should not have, she prayed that she should have a daughter. She forfeited the opportunity to have a tribe, a son, right? Which would have given her one tribe. So in place of that one tribe, what did she end up getting? Two tribes. Two tribes. Two for one. Two for one, right? It was a two for one. She got two tribes instead of that one tribe. And he said that every ounce of Mesirut Nefesh always gets paid back, but it takes some time. Right? It doesn't happen instantaneously. You need the, the wide view of history to see how every ounce of Mesirut Nefesh always gets paid back. He brought another example, which we'll have later on when we get to Shemot. The Medrash tells us that Paro, when he wanted to know what to do with the Jewish problem, called in three advisors. Who were the three advisors? Bilam, Bilam Yitro, 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 and Eov. Okay, what should he do with the Jewish problem? Bilam said, kill them. Right? In the end, Bilam was killed by the Jews in a battle against us. Yitro, Eov was silent. Yitro spoke out on behalf of the Jewish people. And because of that, he was banished. And once again, you stop in the middle of the story, you ask, is this the payback for someone who comes and defends your children? He was banished. Not only that, once he was banished from Egypt, right, he also was excommunicated from the place that he had gone to. Midian. Why? In Midian. Why? Because he had been one of their priests of their idolatry, and he had rejected that to the point that his own daughters, when they would go to collect uh, to, to, to draw water, they'd be chased away by all the shepherds. One time, they came back much faster than they normally did. And the father asked them, why, Miharten, why have you come back so quickly? And they said, well, there was an Egyptian man that helped us. So he said, well, why don't you invite him over for a, uh, to, for a meal, right? And that Egyptian man, of course, was Moshe. And Moshe, of course, married Yitro's daughter, Tzipporah. So Yitro ended up becoming the father-in-law of Moshe. He ended up joining the Jewish people. And his grandchildren, his, his, his family is the, certainly the first family of the Jewish people. So again, the Messiah Nevesh that he made certainly came back, but it's not instantaneous. Right? There is the long view of history to understand how each of these how each of these things take take effect. Now but now there's 14 tribes. Okay, now there's going to be okay. So now there's 14 tribes you're asking. Okay? So we always have 12. Well, it's not really 14. Well, if we're counting Yosef, okay. So first of all, if we count Menashe and Ephraim, then we don't count Yosef. Okay? Which still brings us, though, 13. to 13. But we always have 12. So the way it works is as follows. Shevet Levi, the tribe of Levi, is sometimes counted, sometimes not counted. When we're counting the 12 tribes, Levi is counted differently. So then when we're counting the 12 tribes, we count Levi, 
and then we count Menashe and Ephraim. But that would be 13. Yes, but when counting the 12 tribes, we're only counting 12. We don't count Levi. Yeah. Levi is counted differently. When the land is given out, right. Levi doesn't receive a portion. Who does receive a portion? Menashe and, and Ephraim. So Menashe, so it's either Levi, it's, it's the 10, and Levi and Yosef, or it's the 10, not Levi, and Menashe and Ephraim. Right, that's our accordion of sorts that we always, we always have the 12. Thank you. Okay. Now, another very, very uh, fascinating point is brought up by uh, Rav Yoel bin Nun. Right, did we discuss this last time about Yosef calling home, writing home? No, we didn't. I discussed it on show. It's hard to know what I discussed when I think I discussed at the and by the Sephardim, but not over here and not last week. So I think we're good. Okay. So the question is often asked, why didn't, at least in this point now, Yosef is in charge of Mitzrayim. Why doesn't Yosef write home? His father has never gotten over the mourning, the pain that he's in. Yosef never, never wrote home, never called home. Maybe in the house of Potiphar, right? So he was still a servant over there. Now he's second in command. Why doesn't he contact his family? Let his father know, I'm alive, I'm well. Instead, we wait, and the brothers come down, and we have that whole, that whole uh, concealment of his identity. Right? All that's going on is so, so strange, right? At the end of the parsha, right, the brothers come down for food. Yosef accuses them of being spies and says, listen, right, you know, uh, unless you bring Binyamin, the younger, uh, the, 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 your youngest brother you claim to have, then uh, he locks up Shimon and sends the others back. Yaakov says, how could I send Binyamin? I already lost Yosef. Now I'm going to lose Binyamin, right? Finally, there's no food. He agrees to send Binyamin. Yehuda is the one who guarantees his safe return. Yosef plants the goblet in Binyamin's bag. They're all hauled back to Mitzrayim. Binyamin is going to be a slave. And that's how we conclude this week, Miketz, until we get to next week, Vayigash, when Yehuda goes and advocates on behalf of Binyamin. What is going on with Yosef over here? Why is he not contacting his family? Why is he driving them all crazy over here? So there are two, uh, there are two classical approaches. Ramban offers an unusual approach. Ramban understands that Yosef, the two dreams that he had, what was the first dream? Uh, the wheat, the wheat yeah. bowing down. The second dream was? Stars. Eleven yeah. stars, yeah. sun and the moon. He understood that these dreams were prophecies that he needed to get involved with and make sure that they would come about, be fulfilled in that order. Therefore, Ramban says, had he ever said, Dad, I'm alive, what would happen? his parents would come. And the second dream of the stars and the sun and the moon, the parents bowing down, will be fulfilled before the first dream. Therefore, he couldn't say who he was. And when the brothers came down, it wasn't the first dream yet, because who was missing? Binyamin, right? Binyamin was still missing, right? So he hadn't even fulfilled the first dream yet. Before he could reveal his identity, he had to get Binyamin down. So what does he say? You're spies. And then he says, send Binyamin. Now Binyamin comes, and they all bow down. The first dream has been fulfilled. Why doesn't he at that point say, I'm Yosef? Ramban says, because he's afraid. What would the brothers do to Binyamin on the way back home? So he wants to A, safeguard Binyamin, and B, he wants to see where are the brothers at. So he recreates the whole sale of Yosef 
as a slave, his own sale as a slave, with Binyamin now. He's delivering to the brothers Binyamin being sold, being taken away as a slave on a silver platter. They don't have to sell Binyamin as a slave. He stole the goblet. He was caught. And now he'll be taken as a slave. Let's see how the brothers will react. Once he sees how the brothers react, he now sees that Binyamin is safe and he reveals his identity. Everyone comes down. The second dream is revealed. That's the Ramban's classic approach. What's a little bit strange about the approach is we don't find elsewhere in the Torah that a person has a dream which is a prophecy that he then needs to engineer the fulfillment of that dream. It's a little bit strange. So there is a, a Rav, Rav, Rav Yoel bin Nun in Israel who offers a fascinating <laughs> approach. His approach is that we're assuming that Yosef knows what we know. But let's look back and let's see what Yosef himself knows. Let's go back to the beginning of Vayeshev. Okay, page 200. Yosef's father gives him a special coat. The brothers are jealous. Yosef has the dream, the dream about the stalks. He relates that, page 201. He relates that to his brothers. They say, will you reign over us? Will you dominate us? They hated him even more because of his dreams and because of his talk. He then dreams another dream, verse 9, tells his brothers, right? They don't interpret the dream, right? <laughs> they don't like where this is going. Pasuk Yud, verse 10, he related to his father and to his brothers. His father scolded him, rebuked him, said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamt? Are we to come, I and your mother and your brothers, to bow down to you to the ground? So Yaakov, his father, just yelled at him, rebuked him very strongly. Now, his father had shown this favoritism to him, but now it's causing a lot of dissent. And the father seems to be joining in with his angst at Yosef along with the brothers. Verse 11, so his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Rashi says he was hoping for it to come. But Yosef didn't read Rashi. Yosef didn't know what his father was hoping for it to come about. Or according to Rashi, his father scolded him in front of the brothers so that they shouldn't get even angrier. But really, he was all in for Yosef. Did Yosef know that? No. Yosef did not know that. So his father just rebuked him. And then what happens, page 203? His father, now his brothers went to pasture their flocks, the father's flock in Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, your brothers are there in Shechem. Come, I will send you to them. I want you to go to them. See how they're doing. Yosef's response is, he nani, here I am. So Yosef, his father just rebuked him for causing all this dissent in the family, and now he's sending me away to my brothers, who he knows. Yosef thinks my father knows that they have malevolent intentions towards me, and he's sending me to them. Where is he sending me to? To Shechem. That's a bloody town where Dina and the brothers, are. Right, it's not a very, uh, it's a tough neighborhood. It's South L.A. over there. Right, that's where he's sending him. And he says, Hineni. Hineni is, I'm ready to do what I'm being told to do, even though I'm a little bit unsure about where this is heading. And I'm not clear if, if where it's heading is what I would hope was going to be. As in, Avraham's response to God, when God tells him, take your son Yitzchak Isaac onto the mountain, Avraham says, Hineni. And then he goes there. And then what happens? We know what happens. The brothers throw him into a pit. They want to kill him. They decide not to kill him. Instead, they send him down to Egypt as a slave. And Yosef is wondering, oh, let's hear what my father's response is going to be when this happens. I'm sure he's going to send out a search party. Or, or maybe he doesn't care. Is my father in on this? Or is my father not in on this? He doesn't know. 
He doesn't know the brothers come back with his coat dipped in blood and show it to his father. And his father says, oh, chayara achalatu. He was consumed by an evil animal. I've lost. Taraf, taraf, Yosef. Yosef's been torn apart. He doesn't know that his father's been mourning him for 22 years. What he sees is absolute silence. No one cares. This was part of the dream. So we're asking, why didn't Yosef call home? Yosef sitting by the phone and saying, and saying, why haven't they called for me? Obviously, they don't care. Huh. If they find out that I'm in a position of prominence, maybe they'll come after me again. Now let's come back to Miketz. So we assume that Yosef knows all that we know, but he doesn't know. He's in Egypt. He doesn't know what his father is doing. Now, right, David Foreman points out a very beautiful thing here. Let's look at, we mentioned before that on, on page 224, they pulled him out of the pit, right? And we mentioned it's called a pit over here. Now, this is almost the mirror version of what happened originally. They pulled him out from the pit, okay? Now, the brothers had thrown him into the pit. What did the brothers do right before they threw him into the pit? Take his coat. They stripped him of his coat. Now, what happens? He comes out of the pit. What is he given? He's given new clothes. Okay? Now, before that, right? He comes before Paro. Right? Who had sent him away? Yaakov. Yaakov had sent him away. Now he's coming to who? Her. To Paro. Why had Yaakov, or what happened right before Yaakov sent him away? He told him about the dreams, right? He had his dreams and he was rebuked for the dreams. Now he comes to Paro to hear about dream. Paro's dreams. And what's he going to be now? Praised for his interpretations of the dreams. So on a certain level, right, here he's able to leave all of the angst, all of the anguish of his family, of his background, of his trauma traumatic childhood. He's leaving it all behind. He's now out from the pit. And instead of him being chastised for, with, uh, about his dreams, dreams and his interpretation of dreams is sending him up to the highest heights. And then he interprets the dreams. We saw that. And then he marries us not. And turn to page 230, 231. It's chilling. Now to Joseph were born two sons when the year of famine had not yet sit in, whom Osna, the door of Potiphera, chief of own, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Menashe, for Nashani Elukim, et kol Amali, the eight called Beit Avi. God has made me forget all of my hardship and all of my father's household. What's he saying over here? I can leave all of that trauma, all of that anguish behind me. I can start fresh now. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Rabbi Yol ben Nun again says this indicates that Yosef thought I want to leave all that behind me, right? No one ever came to see, to, fight, to rescue me, to, to redeem me, to see how I'm doing. I've been completely rejected by my family. And that's how Yosef feels. The brothers come down. Why should he show any affinity, affinity to these brothers? He wants to know how Binyamin is. Binyamin is his blood brother. Binyamin was not part of the sale. He loved to see Binyamin. It's only, only, only when 
at the beginning of next week's parsha, when Judah, Yehuda, comes forward and and starts to advocate. There, page 251, there's the first time that he hears what Yaakov thought about his absence. Right? Judah approached him and said, If you please, my Lord, may your servant, may your servant speak to a word in my Lord's ears. Let your anger not flare up. My Lord has asked a servant, Have you a father or a brother? We said, We have an old father, a young child. His brother is dead. Oh. Oh, he hears they think I'm dead. Interesting. And, and he alone, meaning Binyamin, Benjamin alone, is left with his mother. His father loves him. You said, bring him down. And we said, well, you, he can't leave his father. If he leaves his father, he'll die. You said, bring him down, or you can't see my face again. We went back to our father. We told him your words. Our father said, bring him some food. We said, we can't go down. Only if Binyamin is with us. We can't see him, the face of this man, without Binyamin. Then your servant, verse 27, my father said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One has left me, and I presumed, alas, he has surely been torn to pieces. I have not seen him since. You should take this one too from my presence and disaster before him. You will bring me down in evil to the grave, my old age, in evil to the grave. Right? And therefore, right, he will die if we don't bring him back. Right? And then he goes on saying, I took responsibility for the youth of my father, saying. Now for the first time, Yosef hears, oh, my father didn't reject me. My father didn't forget about me. My father thought that I was dead. My father thought that I was torn up. I was consumed by animals. It wasn't a rejection. Not only that, but here is Yehuda the leader of the brothers, as opposed to what he did to me, he is defending Binyamin. Not only is he defending Binyamin, but he recognizes how much our father loves Binyamin. Listen to what Yehuda is saying. If we go back without Binyamin, my father's going to die of pain. I'll stay instead, let Binyamin go back. What does that mean? They go back without me, my father's okay. They go back without Binyamin, my father's going to die. So he is recognizing the special place Binyamin has, and he says that's okay. That's okay. Yosef now has a complete new view on everything. Yosef says, Ani Yosef, I'm Yosef. Haod Avichai, my father's still alive and we can start now to rebuild. And according to this approach, it's such a powerful lesson. How many times do we sit by the phone saying, why isn't this person calling me? We don't sit by a phone, we have our cell phones. Okay, so no, we no longer sit by a phone. That's, that, that's an anachronism. Why sit, just take it with you. Okay, but how often do we wait for someone else to make the call? And we're bothered, why are they not making the call? And they're probably sitting with their view of the situation, which is completely different than our view, and they're, so to speak, sitting by their phone, wondering, why aren't we calling? That we get locked into our perspective. There, right, Yosef was saying, why is Yosef calling home? Right, well, we know what Yosef doesn't know. So we say, why is Yosef calling home? Yosef, knowing what he knows and not knowing what he doesn't know, is wondering, why aren't they calling me? We very often get locked into our own perspectives. And in order to make the shalom, in order to uh, bring about the peace, what we need to do is be willing to recognize that there's a perspective beyond our own, right? And the same way that I'm all upset, maybe they're upset. The same way I think that I've been wronged, maybe they think they have been wronged. Maybe we should, maybe I should initiate. Maybe we should sit down and talk and discuss it and try to gain the other's perspective 
and try to sort this out. Yes, though. Does Yosef know he's wearing a Jewish girl? That's a great question. That's a great Is question. Is that why Yaakov uh, made the next I, 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 I don't know. I don't think, I don't think that, that Pigot of Elazar speaks about this. I don't know, though. Did she know? Did she know her background? You know, I heard a midrash or read a midrash where she had some kind of locket that proved yeah, the, what yeah. family she came yeah, from. The med- yeah, the midrash said that, yeah, that there was a locket with the Shem Hashem around her neck. Mm-hmm. Did she know what that meant? Yeah. You know, what that yeah. really was. Just, I saw a very interesting, I had to share one thing with everybody, right? Hanukkah. Okay? Well, well, one thing that we can change, that, that, that we can apply is Hanukkah is a celebration of two miracles, right? One is the miracle of the battle, right? The other is the miracle of the, of the oil, right? right? And right, both of them make us realize, right? Is there a common denominator here? Both of them make us realize that we don't see the whole picture, as we just discussed with Yosef and the brothers, right? We think that the oil is what gives the strength, is what gives the strength, of what, what gives the, the properties for, for fire, for combustion, right? Hashem. Hashem works through nature, but he's the one who tells her the, fa- the, famous, the famous story. Right? The famous question is, why do we celebrate eight days if there's only seven days that were miraculous because there was enough oil for one day? That's the famous Beit Yosef question, to which there are hundreds of answers. An answer that I love is the Gemara Tana tells a story that the daughter of Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa had confused the flask of oil and the flask of vinegar. And, and she had lit Shabbos candles, right? so she, pour, uh, uh, she lit Shabbos candles with the flask of vinegar, which doesn't burn. There must have been some oil on the bottom which went up to the top. Right? When she realized her mistake, right, she realized that they were going to burn out. They weren't going, they were going to extinguish. They weren't going to burn the proper amount of time. She came, it was already Shabbos. She couldn't fix it. came to her father. Her father said, don't worry, the same God that tells the oil to burn will tell, can tell the vinegar to burn. But the Murrah says the vinegar burned all the way till Saturday night, Motzei Shabbat. They used that to light the Havdalah, for Havdalah. So we think that, oh, oil burns and vinegar doesn't burn, and that's true. Those are the normal properties. But Hanukkah makes us realize that there are no such really normal properties. And it's the Yad Hashem, it's the end of Hashem, that is involved in all that goes on. Similarly, we think battles are won by the, by the more experienced, by the stronger, right? by the ones who have greater weaponry. And as we've seen in our time, right, you know, the Six Day War in Israel, right, we see that you could have the Rabbim Miyad Ma'atim, the many into the hands of the few, that our, our view should not be distorted. This, the, 